Hello and welcome back. And well, as you just saw, we've got the mill up and running, cutting out a memory board. And it is a big one. Uh, as you saw, we had about, uh, I think, 177,000 steps for the CNC uh, program to go through. And when I left it, we were on like step 1,000. So it's probably gonna take about another four to five hours for that to cut. And I hope it actually cuts all right. Sometimes our CNC computer tends to glitch out when it's 100 degrees outside. And well, it's 100 degrees outside. It is very hot out there. Uh, but it all seemed to be working correctly when I left it. So hopefully it all goes smoothly over the next four to five hours. But that leaves us with some time to maybe answer a burning question that you guys are having because I think you've probably figured out what it is that I'm cutting based on the uh, thumbnail and the title of the video. I am cutting a memory board for the computer, but the burning question is most likely, why does it look like that? Such a long, skinny, singular PCB, something that I have not cut anything that big before. And well, that's what I hope to answer today. So let's hop over to the bench. We'll take a look at uh, the overall construction of the memory. We'll take a look at how I'm planning on addressing it, take a look at the memory map itself, and then hopefully uh, our cut will finish up smoothly. We'll solder it all together and we will have a very large memory board to test out. So let's hop over there and get started. When we were developing the processor, we essentially just copied Motorola's homework with the MC14500. We made a few changes internally, but the overall architecture is incredibly similar. But the MC14500 wasn't built with vacuum tubes, so they don't quite have as many of the crazy limitations that we do. So now that the processor is built and working, we need to build a lot of other things that are very, very specific specific to our particular build. And the memory is exactly that. I was not able to essentially just steal a design from an integrated circuit and implement it because memory is incredibly difficult. So I had to start at as high of a level as I could, and that was trying to figure out what our control word would look like. We know that the processor needs a four bit instruction. So that is what the most significant four bits of our control word are going to be. Now through designing the vacuum tube memory that we are ultimately going to build, I had some pretty heavy space constraints. And ultimately we're going to use a six bit address, which will let us address 64 bits of memory. That's not a lot. And it may seem weird to think of a six bit address as addressing just 64 bits of memory, but in an eight bit CPU, you have an eight bit data bus. So one memory location addresses a full byte of information. But because we only have a one bit data bus, one memory location only addresses one bit of information for us. So if we want really large memory, our control word has to become massive. So a six bit memory address seemed like a good starting point, but it is going to get limiting if we want to do something more complex with this processor. And I think the processor itself should be capable of doing it. So I have an extra two bits here in the center that are my bank bits. So we can have up to four different banks of 64 bits of memory, which means that with this control word, we should be able to address a total of 256 bits of memory or 32 bytes. But the extra banks of memory are essentially just a memory expansion. I'm not going to build them initially. I'm going to build the entire computer first, and then maybe we can do something a little more interesting like acoustic delay lines or maybe even a rotating drum, but that's all massively in the future. Right now we're just focusing on bank zero zero, which is just 64 bits of memory, and I'm not actually going to use all 64 bits of it. So let's take a look at the memory map here. And this is actually laid out exactly like I'm planning on physically laying out the circuit boards themselves. And because I'm doing things in six bits, I'm actually using octal here. And octal can sometimes be a little frustrating to read, 
but I also have the binary written underneath the octal, so it hopefully is a little easier to read. But essentially we're going to have uh, an X line and a Y line, and that X and Y selection is going to select the specific bit that we're working for. So the X is represented by the high digit of our octal number here, and the Y is represented by our low digit of the octal number here. So a Y of four accesses any of these bits right here, and an X of say three will then lock us in at this exact bit right here. But in order to get to 64 bits, we need to get it all the way up to octal seven, seven. And well, we can see that our tube memory, our main grid here stops at octal five, seven. So the last 16 bits of memory can't actually be written to. I've set those aside and reserved them for other things. From octal 60 to octal 67, this is eight bits of external input. So this is going to be an input that's coming from say a teletype or could actually be physical switches. Octal 70 and 71 is a loopback of the result register. This is something that the MC14500 was very adamant about because you can do a lot of really interesting things with this. Now octal 72 and 73 are tied high all the time. And so if I need to force a one onto the data bus, I can just set the address to 72 or 73. And there I go, I have my high bit on the data bus. Octal 74 through 77 are primarily going to be used for input output control. Now I haven't exactly decided what I want to control with these, but that's something that we'll tackle when we get to the input output board. So we have an idea of how we're going to lay out the memory, but now we have to start figuring out how to actualize that. This logic diagram shows the very basics of how we're going to build the memory itself. And if we look at the collection of four NOR gates that are right next to each other, we can see that this is essentially a D flip-flop. Into pretty much any D flip-flop, you have two inputs. You have a clock and you have data. Data is up here on the top and that is just hooked up to the data bus. The clock is this three input OR gate down here and it is all active low. And the bottom two inputs are our X select and our Y select. The third signal is the inverse of the right signal. Now the right signal is only high when the clock is high and we're executing an STO or an STOC operation. So it can double as the primary clock input here. And then on the output side, we're reading off of the final NOR gate of our D flip-flop, and this goes into a large four input NOR gate. The top input is actually the regular right signal, the non-inverted right signal, and the bottom two inputs are our X select and our Y select. And just like the three input OR gate at the front, this is all active low. And that is why in the previous episode, when we took a look at uh, this little guy right here, which was our one bit uh, test piece of vacuum tube memory, the VFT was actually inverse of what we would normally think. When the memory cell is storing a zero, the VFD is on, and when the memory cell is storing a one, the VFD is off. But if we take a look at the PCB design itself, we can see that there's actually, I believe, exactly 20 jumpers per bit. And I need to make 48 bits, and so that is almost a thousand jumpers that I would have to cut, bend to the right shape, and solder in place. And it's not impossible, but it would certainly push my sanity to the limits. But thankfully in the Discord, I shared my designs and a very special person, Figulus, came to my rescue. He went through an insane amount of work to cut down on the number of jumpers. And I believe it's down to just four per bit now. There's a ton of very beautiful design elements in here that I just absolutely love. Like this very long curve here that snakes through a spot that would be kind of difficult to do with uh, smaller curves. And then there's a lot of great symmetry with the 180 degree curves that follow each other here and, and over here. It's just a beautiful design and I could not thank Figulus enough for it. It's absolutely amazing. So now that we have an idea of how to build each individual
individual bit, it's time to think about, well, how to build all 48 bits plus the extra control that we have on the bottom. And I have a pretty specific size restraint. I want the memory to have the same overall footprint as the processor. And this is the processor as it sits right now. And it is roughly one meter tall and 0.7 meters wide. And so if we take a look at the design that I have for the memory now, you can see it's incredibly dense. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but the bulk of what we're concerned about and well what we're cutting on the mill today is right here in the center. This massive collection of boards that all look identical. Each one of these boards has four bits of memory on it and they are incredibly wide. They're about 500 millimeters wide. So with each one of these boards containing four bits, there has to be 12 boards that are completely identical. So that's our game plan for the memory. It seems a little restrictive at first, but we've set up the control word in such a way that we can expand it out in the future with memory expansions that potentially use different types. But for now, the big hurdle that we have to clear is cutting all 12 of these four bit memory boards. And the one on the mill should be hopefully maybe two thirds of the way done. So let's um, hop out there and take a look. And yeah, that's coming along really nicely. And so as soon as it was finished, it was time to uh, pull it off, take a look at our handiwork, and then it was time to start soldering it up. But it is such a huge PCB, and I have a bad tendency to make really simple mistakes in my circuits that often require me to recut a board. So I wanted to make sure that uh, the design was actually solid. And since it's uh, four bits split evenly across the entire board, the bits don't actually interact with each other. So I only need to solder up one bit and the remaining bits should work just fine. So that's what I'm doing here getting it all soldered up and once it is I'll give it a quick little test and yeah that all seems to be working perfectly. So now all I have to do is solder up the remaining three bits. All right, here it is all soldered up and looking beautiful. It is without a doubt one of the longest PCBs I have ever cut and certainly the densest PCB that I've ever tried to solder up in one go. And it was a journey to get this thing soldered. Uh, it took uh, combined probably about six hours. Yesterday I just uh, got stuck into it. I hopped on the Discord, started a live chat with a lot of really wonderful people and they helped keep my sanity to uh, reasonable levels while fighting through soldering all of this up. Uh, but now that it's all soldered up, it's time to give it a test. And I've got it hooked up to my little uh, breadboard back here, which is giving us enough signals going through all of these jumpers here to actually properly test this out. So there's four bits here, and uh, ultimately there will be eight bits on a single X select line. Uh, and then, uh, each of those eight bits will have an individual Y select line. But because we only have four bits, the uh, Y select lines, there's only four of them. So I have a bunch of little switches over here that let me select the exact position that I want to select. The little tube here is to supply an inverted right signal coming from the button. So right now we can see that all four of our VFDs are off, which means that each of the four bits is storing a one. So on our four bit block here, we have one, 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 one. So let's uh, see if we can get this third bit to change to a zero. So I'll just select it with my little toggle switch up here, and then I'll hit the right signal. And yeah, there we go, the VFD came on. So now we have uh, one, one, zero, one. Uh, let's see if we can get a zero into the fourth bit here. So we'll select it, we'll hit the, uh, Little button there, and there we go. We've got one, one, zero, zero. Uh, all right, yeah, let's just go ahead and test all four of them. This is uh, bit two. Yep, there we go. And then this is bit one. And uh, yeah, there we go. The, this one is a, a little dim, but I did check the voltage on it, and it's the exact same voltage for all four. So it's just a, 
a slightly dimmer VFD. But uh, we can see that we've now got uh, 0, 0, 0, 0 stored in our four bits. So there we go, we've got our first four bits of vacuum tube memory built. This is an epic milestone, uh, but we have a long way to go. As a matter of fact, we have 11 more of these boards that are pretty much exactly the same to build. That is going to be a serious endeavor that is very time consuming and frankly would be very boring to watch on video. So in the next video, we're not going to be working explicitly on the memory itself. Well, that's going to be going on in the background for pretty much every video for the foreseeable future. But instead, we're going to be doing a little bit of woodworking to build up a wooden backboard that we can mount all of our memory to, as well as build a rack that will hold the processor and the memory board. But in the meantime, I'm going to keep playing with this. I think it's a ton of fun and it looks really cool. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.